everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, uh, freelance writer at BillboardAccess.com, Variety, and wherever I can place my byline. And someday on it'll be on a book, but we'll, we'll talk about that in the future sometimes. Anyway, I'm um, welcoming you to another episode of Things We Said Today, our weekly discussion about the Beatles, past, present, and sometime in the future, maybe. Let me start by introducing my two cohorts from the state of Maine. He's our musicologist, former editor of the Beatles desk at the New York Times, if, and if you didn't know there was one, there was, classical music expert and author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and God, that's something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Have I said that long enough? Alan Cozen. <laughs> hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And the host of the very syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, from the state of Connecticut, where the Red Sox are going to win the World Championship, well, are are in the neighborhood to where the Red Sox are going to win the World Series this year. Never. Um, (laughs) Alan Alan has his fingers crossed. Yeah, I know. Um, (laughs) Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi. I hope my show gets even more syndicated. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Okay. Um, well, a- actually, this show could get more syndicated. So there, uh, if you want to syndicate this show, we would love to have you. Um, anyway, we are going to talk today about John Lennon's Walls and Bridges album. But first, we're going to talk a, a, do a quick run of news. The first thing is uh, this past week, uh, the Olympics opened in Korea, in South Korea. And they played Imagine at the opening ceremony, not as gloriously as they did in London with with John's picture, but uh, some a children's choir uh, sang it. And um, from the reports I saw, I did not see it, but from the reports I saw, it was pretty good. Um, any of you guys see it? Nope. No. <laughs> oh, okay. That would involve oh, for- watching the Olympics, and like I have no intention of doing that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I watched some of it. I watched some of it. Well, yeah, the time difference makes it kind of crazy, but uh, but anyway. All right. Secondly, um, we have uh, a kind of a, a little piece of bad news. Mickey Jones, who probably was named probably not familiar to everyone, but he played drums with Trini Lopez, played uh, on tour with the Beatles. He also drummed with Johnny Rivers, Kenny Rogers in the first edition, Charlie Daniels, and Bob Dylan um, passed away this past week at age 76. And I, when I heard his name, I kind of went, you know, I've heard that name before. And it's because he had put out a DVD of his um, home of his home movies taken on the Dylan tour in 1966. And he also went and interviewed Trini Lopez and, and Johnny Rivers and, and, showed some of the his home movies and if you look around you should be able to find that pretty cheap it's not it's not i don't think it's very expensive it was put out by highway entertainment by the same guy by the way who did that ridiculous um uh, paul mccartney is dead uh, parody dvd it's the same guy but this actually isn't too bad so there we go Oh, and another th- the thing that uh, just came up that Ken was telling us about uh, as we before we came on the air was the Israeli Wolf Prize has been announced, and Paul McCartney is going to be one of the recipients. I, I haven't read the story, so I don't. I guess that, is that in, within a couple months, Ken? You, you it's know? the the end of May. End of May. Okay. It's awarded to. Uh, it says nine laureates in the fields of music and science. And um, Paul has been selected. He'll he'll share the prize with conductor Adam Fisher. Uh, it says for being one of the greatest songwriters of all time. They don't know whether or not Paul will attend uh, the ceremony for this award, but um, he will be getting it. Okay. Well, that's that's uh, that's interesting. Okay, and, and chalk up another award for Mr. McCartney. Lastly, I think the thing that got the biggest amount of discussion in social media this past week was the Quincy Jones interview uh, in which he talked about Michael Jackson. He talked about a lot of different things, but he did talk about McCartney or I did talk about the Beatles, excuse me. And he talked about McCartney and talked about Ringo and he had some kind of disparaging things to say and people got really uptight. And my response to that, to that whole interview was, 
Quincy Jones is a curmudgeon, and I would not pay a whole lot of attention to what he was saying. I mean, for one, as Ken pointed out, he talked about Ringo's drum, uh, drumming on Love is a Man, Many Splendored Thing. Um, he and didn't, he didn't Sam actually say journey. specifically what he was talking about. He just said, "Yes, he, he yes, he did." Uh, I, ha- I, I, have, I have the quote. I have the quote here. I don't remember him mentioning "Love Is Many Splendored Things" specifically. He did. He really? did. Oh. He, yeah, because he had because he he said, "I remember once we were in the studio with George Martin and Ringo arranged a version of "Love Is a Many Splendored Thing" for Starr's 1970 solo debut album, "Sentimental Journey." It says Ringo so, arranged it. We, uh, yes, he said Ringo arranged it. Because he arranged that's, it, didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> Quincy arranged it. Well, that's the that's the quote from the from the Vulture dot com version, which is the original version, by the way. Interesting. People were there were a lot of there were a lot of social media pickups of this interview, and everybody was twisting and you know twisting the the quotes and everything like that. But the Vulture dot com interview is the original interview, and if you're going to read it. You know, at least read it in context. But um, but the thing about Sentimental Journey is, it was my understanding that Ringo was strictly to be the singer. He had no intention of drumming at all on the album. The same right. way that John John wanted to be the singer on rock and roll. You know, right? Just let and, Phil produce it. That was like it's the same kind of an idea. So I I didn't even think that Ringo even considered drumming on any track. Right, but uh, that's that's the reason to really. You know, put some doubt on the whole interview because, you know, a lot of the stuff he says in there is pretty, you know, is pretty hot. And, you know, and a lot of it may not be true. I mean, you have to question the truth of some of the stuff that he says. I mean, I I, I kind of don't doubt about Michael Jackson stealing, you know, uh, licks from people. I mean, that happens a lot, you know, but some of the other stuff he said – you know, and not just about the Beatles. You have to kind of wonder. You know. Well, I think if you know, if it's about love is a many splendored thing, and he's talking about in the in the quote, I'm not sure if which side I read it on, but it was a long QA version of what I read. Right. Um, and uh, you know, so he's talking about Ringo going off to lunch and him bringing in another drummer, and uh, I, I guess I must have missed the love is a many splendored thing part. Um, if that was his arrangement and George Martin was producing, he could very well have said, you know, what drummer he thought would do a good job on it and brought him in. So all that part could be true, just not true about Ringo drumming on it and not being able to do it. Um, right. Do you want me to you want me to read a little more of this? Because I have, like I said, I have the full quote here. Um, it, it doesn't matter really, does it? <laughs> the other thing, I mean, you know, the thing that struck me most about his Beatles-related quote is he's giving the impression that he heard them early on, I suppose, when they first came here, and he thought that they were just awful musicians and that McCartney was the worst bassist he'd heard. Now, come on. Let's say the earliest he would have heard them probably would have been when they came here in 64. And by 64, we know what his bass lines sound like. We've heard the records. Yeah. We've heard the live performances from 64. Right. You, you cannot seriously say that he was a bad bassist. You know, right. nobody would say that. So He mentioned he mentions well, Ronnie Varell, by the way, as the drummer on that track, mm-hmm. as, as the drummer that they, that they used to – to do a little bit of work on the track. so mm-hmm. What a lot of people are saying in response to that about what he said about the Beatles being bad musicians and Paul being a, you know the worst bass player mm-hmm. uh, is that Quincy comes from a world of jazz mm-hmm. and he also comes from uh, a world where he works with a lot of studio people. I think that he probably frowns on people who are self-taught like the Beatles were. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's used That's to working point. with the cream of the crop, so he probably looks down, maybe even still, on those kind of musicians. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that surprised me, especially where Michael Jackson is concerned, is that you never heard Quincy Jones say anything like that when he was producing Thriller. Right. You know, he wasn't complaining at all about all the money he was making for Michael Jackson. Right. But still, he is Quincy Jones, and he has a resume that's so impressive. It isn't just Michael Jackson. Yeah. You can go back to, you know, Frank Sinatra, Dinah Washington, some of the greatest singers ever. Sure. And he's worked with them. So, But at the same time, it's his opinion. 
Yeah. Right. So he has a right to say what he feels like, and it's not going to change the way we feel. But the interview also has a lot of conspiracy theories and stuff, and it's just it's really – it's a strange interview. Let's put it that way. But mm. in any event, in any event, can you have some reviews that we requested from the Australian – McCartney Australian shows? Okay. Um, do you want to you wanna quickly run through a couple of those now? All right. Well, we got, I believe, uh, four people writing in. Um, so I'm just going to read some of what they had to say, and we want to thank each of them for writing in because we did request it. One of them came from Jonathan Callender, who lives in Kingscliff, and he went to two shows, the one in Melbourne on December 5th and in Brisbane on December 9th. I'm only going to pull some of what he had to say because it's okay. fairly lengthy. Um, he said, this band has been on the road now for many months and together for years, of course, and it showed in some ways. They were wonderfully tight and yet loose in a fun way at times. Superb musicians led by the greatest rock bassist in history, who still plays that little bass and the guitar and the piano like the master that he is. Too much has been criticized about his song list selection in recent years. It's mostly banal rhetoric by spoiled Americans, in my view. <laughs> like like us, I suppose. <laughs> um, I don't know how many U.S. tours he has done in the last 40 years, but it's been just two tours here in Australia. I don't begrudge Sir Paul for playing where the tours are more economical, easier, and close to his various homes, but I do resent the U.S.-centric opinions and conversations that micromanage his song selections and perceived lack of set variation. I am obviously very jealous of the American fans for their McCartney-saturated concert schedules, but I know many of them sympathize with us Australians. I don't think that I, I, I can't see that uh, American that Americans are controlling that like that. I don't agree with that. But all right, never mind. I don't think he's saying controlling, but you know he plays here so often. Well, yeah, you know, the U.S. is I, is I, almost always a first consideration. I think there's a reason for that, and the reason we is we know it's money. I mean, that's basically what that is you know but okay. go, ahead. go ahead the other main complaint many fans in the states seem to have is about the voice these should be about the the tv tripe of the same name <laughs> i don't know what that means this either. this night of the realm is 75 years old and has been singing to fans for 60 years he hasn't changed song keys and he shouldn't because that changes the soul of a song and he can still reach most notes in his amazing canon. I admit he has not the strength vocally he did on the Reaper Bond, or even in 1993. But I compliment the voice that has matured and aged very well and delivers generously to stadiums of fans in Australia in 2017. A sweet tone remains, and those chords have been given vigorously uh, and continue to do so. Still okay. extremely enthusiastic and fresh on stage, Paul is a consummate performer and a musician-songwriter without peer. Okay, next one. Uh, this is from Lewis Buckingham. I don't know where in Australia he's from. I saw Paul play here in Sydney on Monday night, and just to weigh in on the off-and-on debate about his voice, he sounded incredible. As far as I could tell, he never missed a note, and he never sounded in any way like he was struggling. I get it, everyone has off nights, and of course, Paul may have had some, but the questions about his voice that often pop up are distracting and led to anxiety in the lead-up to the gig instead of anticipation. I got into the Beatles in 1994, one year after he last toured here, and my concern that I'd be disappointed put a damper on the whole experience until he first opened his mouth on stage. Has anyone else found the same thing? Okay, and I'll just read one more. Okay. This is from Stephen Cornish. Where to start with highlights? I guess visually live and let die with the fireworks and explosions. You could feel the bursts of heat as the flames exploded. But this song is a strong, exciting song, and the musicianship was superb. And even without the visual, it would be a highlight. Emotionally, it doesn't get much better than the George and John dedications. Paul sounds so vulnerable on here today, and something brings a tear to the eye, as did A Day in the Life, Give Peace a Chance medley. I love Paul's arrangement of something and seeing it live was really special. Then there's the Beatle Classics, which, played by this band, sounds so fresh, even though they have been played many times. Wings was a great era for Paul songs, and seeing it perform 1985, as well as various other Wings songs, was another highlight. I really enjoyed hearing Junior's Farm again. Uh, 
four or five seconds was interesting, but not one of the highlights. This could be my lack of familiarity <laughs> with the song. However, I found it more enjoyable than the original. <laughs> Paul sang two more recent songs from the new album. Would have been nice to have heard more, but with so many songs in his catalog, it's understandable that he doesn't. Finally, one must mention Hey Jude, one of the best concert sing-along songs ever, and the Abbey Road ending, which left me completely satisfied and wanting more at the same time. <laughs> yeah, one more thing. He says, finally, a lot has been written about Paul's voice. I was interested to see how his voice would hold up performing live. One can't deny that he doesn't have the range he once had, but my God, he makes the most of the range he still has. He can still belt out songs like Birthday and is more than capable with songs like Yesterday and Blackbird. Okay. All right. Thank thank you, folks, for sending those in. Um, so do any of you want to respond to these to these letters? Not really. I mean, like I said, um, you know, it, it's great to have the, the first person, you know, the first person comments like that. And um, be interesting to see if we get if we get uh, others, uh, you know, with different perspectives. Um, but. Um, yeah, it's it's not. It's interesting. I, what I think the one the comment that got me the most was being aware of the voice comments, the comments about his voice. Yeah. Before you go in, I haven't seen him this year, but I mean, when I saw him last year, yeah, I mean, sure you think about that. I mean, you know, given how old he is, you consider you know you think I guess the same about Ringo, but Ringo hasn't had the been the issue that Paul has, you know, partially because Ringo doesn't sing as many songs as Paul does. It's more than that, as we've discussed. I mean, mm -hmm. Ringo's songs are not as vocally demanding as Paul's. Well, right. Right. You know, I mean, and, he, knows, he, he, he has it planned very nicely. Let's put, you know, very, it, he does. So Yeah, he knows where his comfort level is. He knows what he could handle, and that's exactly what Ringo does, and it's very right. smart of him. Right. You know, I just hope that people don't get too offended when we bring up the thing about Paul and his voice here, because we're only bringing it up because we're concerned. And, um, you know, as I've said, there have been times when I've heard him struggle. He is human. He is now 75, about to be 76 years old. And as I've said many times, it's remarkable what he pulls off on stage with a, a near three-hour show. For anybody, right. even for someone in their 20s or 30s to do that is pretty amazing. Right. So, um uh, I, I don't want to come across as though it's very difficult when you're in a position where, uh, on the one hand, you feel like you have to be critical to be objective. But at the same time, I could easily just not be critical at all and just be so appreciative of everything that he's done, considering the fact that he just doesn't have to do this. <laughs> right. You know, he's doing this for his fans and he's doing it because he still loves it. And that alone is remarkable. Well, and I that think alone. I, I, I think the yeah. last part of it is, is is what it is. I mean, he he's doing it because he loves it. So, I but mean, he that's... also knows there are fans all over the world that would love to see him who either have never seen him before. You know, with the Beatles, you still have new generations of fans that are cropping up. So you have to meet their needs. You know, and I'm sure that a lot of people around the world, there's so many people that have never seen him still live, and mm -hmm. there are certain areas like Australia where he hasn't been there since 1993 until now. So. It's a great opportunity for people around the world to see him, and even for people who have already seen him who still want to see him more. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's one of the few legends who are left, who are still actively out there doing anything. Right. You know, and especially in recent years, how we've been feeling all the major passings that have happened. And in the last few weeks, <laughs> all the news that we've been hearing about, you know, Elton John is about to retire, it's his last tour. Paul Simon's about to retire. All these giants, all these icons, you know, there aren't many left. So we have to treasure these people while we still have them and right. be so grateful with, that they're still – that they're out there doing anything. Yep. Anyway, let's get to our main attraction. How, how do you like that? Main attraction <laughs> of the uh, – our chief topic of the day. We're going to talk about walls and bridges. And like – uh, it had been a while since I had heard this, and I was just really floored of how good this album is. I mean, it, and I'm not saying that to to try and you know soften this up and 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 you know and and make it everything you know everything great about the Beatles, but it really is a great album. There's only one or two cuts I I found that 
we're really n- not up to the rest of them. But the ones that are really good are just absolutely astounding. I, I, I was really, I was really stunned. I was really, and I spent some time listening to a lot of the demo or the outtakes too, and the differences. I mean, the workups between the outtakes and the the um, the finished versions were great. And by the way, I, I don't know about you guys, but I used the original CD, um, the one without the bonus tracks. So I, I, I don't. Did you guys use the original CDs or the bonus tracks? I use the 2010 Signature Box one, which is basically the, the original mix. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. when I do listen now, I listen to that one. But sometimes I listen to the remixes from the 2000s yeah. because of the bonus material. But, um, you know, when I think of Walls and Bridges, I think of the album itself without the bonus material. Right. Really. You know, the original 1974 album, which is what right. I go by. Right. Okay. Well, I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, that uh, you know have us agreeing on that at the outset, or making it clear what we had listened to, um, and I'm glad we all kind of basically stuck to the same thing. Let's start with the first track, "Going Down on Love." Um, it. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go around the. Uh, I'm gonna start with Alan. Alan, what do you have to say about "Going Down on Love"? That's one that I'm not that crazy about. Um... We, you mentioned um, listening to the album and being floored by how good it was, but that there were certain things that you didn't like as much as the others. Um, in mm-hmm. in my case, uh, I, I had that experience too, but in, in my case, the ones that I liked less are the ones that sounded tied to the 1970s when it was recorded, really? 1974, where it's something like um, Number Nine Dream, Surprise, Surprise, you know, th- those things are, you know, they're basically John's classic style. They, they could almost have been done during the Beatles era, or they could have been done, you know, way after 1974. Mm-hmm. Um, but something like, you know, Going Down on Love... Um, and, and certain of the others, I'm, I'm really talking about just the arrangements, you know, the kind of mm-hmm. use of horns and percussion and that kind of thing that, that to me sounds a little bit cluttery, and I hear it, and I think 1970s production style. Um, you right. Know, the same way that, you know, when you put on an old film, and the film score comes up, and it's got an electric piano and a... Uh, a saxophone and like like there's just certain things that you know in the 70s when they were on we didn't really think twice about it but now that there's been a few decades you know in between we we listen to the sound and we and we can identify the decade and and the style and sensibility so going down on love has some of that and uh, you know i also don't think it's one of the best songs on the album so in a way i'm surprised that he opened with it um, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's so, so that one, um, yeah, that one, I, I just wasn't crazy about. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily turn it off if, uh, you know, someone had it on, but, uh, I'd say if it was on the radio, but like, that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, cause I actually, on my show it will. <laughs> okay. cause I, cause I, cause I noted, I noted on my notes that I thought the outtakes were, the demo, demo outtakes were better because they were bearer you know they were they were you know there was less there to clutter up the mix so I, I i i agree with kind of what you said there ken i totally disagree <laughs> but uh, because i don't think that it sounds cluttered at all i love the production on that song i think what's shocking about it is that he started the album with a slow song and a slow song that's depressing (laughs) you know i mean um somebody please help me Uh, you know i'm drowning in a sea of hatred you know it's um not exactly uplifting it's not that you know you'd you'd love to start an album off with a rocker although let's face it (laughs) look at mother i mean there's there's another song that you start off with on an album that's very depressing right there right but um i love the percussion that she used on it it's very different to start off an album that way in general um, love the lyrics, love the melody. You know, overall, Walls and Bridges is one of my favorite John Lennon albums, and I don't think that the production suffers at all. I think that album was impeccably produced. I like the way all the songs were produced, as a matter of fact. But I really love, in particular, the the, the percussion 
and going down on love. I love the melody of it. And I always love John's vocals on everything okay. that he does. I wouldn't say that the, the demos necessarily are, are, are better. I, I find them interesting because you hear the evolution of what was going to happen with it later on. But no, I love going down on love <laughs> as an opening track. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's the lyrics that you know. Maybe if the lyrics had been a little better, what lyrics don't you like in there? Well, I mean, just the just the I guess the title. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's it. That's what it is. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, there are some great. There are some songs with great lyrics on this album. There's no no question about it. I mean, uh, you know, some of the other songs, and I don't want to get ahead. Are are have some of the best lyrics he ever did but i mean that one just i don't know he's talking about you know the relationship with yoko at the time and right you know one one line from john that often gets quoted is something precious and rare disappears in thin air Mm -hmm. that's from that song right that's a great line right so i mean the way the whole thing was arranged was perfect for the mood of the song you know Okay. So, you yeah. are welcome to disagree, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, next song is "Whatever Gets You Through the Night," and I was in, uh, in, in. I mean, this I, you, it's hard to criticize this one because it's such a great song, and it became such a a standout on the album. And uh, I loved listening to the the outtakes, and it started out with an acoustic guitar, which was really kind of interesting, and they. They, in the process of, of getting to the finished version, they played with the beat quite a bit. They did all sorts of, they did it slow, they did it medium, they did it fast, which is mm. really kind of interesting on its own. But, I mean, uh, yeah, this song is just so good. And, and, you know, the fact that he did it live, you know, with Elton, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's just, it's hard to criticize this one. It really is. Um, Alan? Yeah, I basically agree. Um, it's It's... It too has some of those '70s touches, but they're not so overwhelming that um, you know that it that it doesn't transcend its time. And uh, it uh, it's you know it was great track at the time. It's it's great track now. I did listen to one of the bonus tracks on the 2005 remix um, just Mm -hmm. because it was an interview and I I wanted to see what he had to say at the time about some of these things. It was an interview with Bob Mercer three minutes and three, four minutes. Bob Mercer was a promo guy, an EMI promo guy and this was recorded just for uh, I guess to play to an EMI sales convention or something because it's got Mm. to do with promoting the record and in that interview he talks about how Elton is just like the most incredible pianist he'd ever seen. And he's seen some incredible pianists like Nicky Hopkins, who also plays on this album. Um, so, you know, that's something to say, really. And, uh, you know, not to mention that on, on the basis of of this track uh, and it becoming a hit, uh, you know, that coaxed him out onto the stage, you know, one more time. So that was a good right. thing, too. right. We should also mention a few of the other people besides Nicky Hopkins. Klaus Warman was on it. Yep. Of course, you can't you can't miss Bobby Keys. Jesse Ed was on it. Uh, Keltner was on it. There there are a few other names too, but those are the I think the names that are probably most uh, well known. And then Ringo did the promo, did the uh, ad that uh, I'm, that got bootlegged, uh, and uh, <laughs> so he did the radio ad for that. Um, Ken, your your shot at this one. Oh, it's a great song. It's a great single. I actually do like that early version of the song. It's a lot looser, and in some ways, it works very well on that level. But which, you can tell which that, early which early version are you talking about? The one that's um, it's on the John Lennon anthology. Okay, and it's like a it's a full version. It's um, you know, it doesn't have the piano part on there, but okay. it has like a different guitar line through it and it and works on on that level i think if it only came out that way it would be a good song but having elton and that version he really pumped it up and he made it you know the great song that it is the great recording that it is mm-hmm. and you can't say enough about bobby keys for his sax playing because right. that really makes it stand out his his sax playing throughout the song 
Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's a, definitely a you know a dynamite single. And um, I just have a question for Alan because I'm getting the feeling that you're talking about 1970s music as though it sounds dated to you. Uh, this definitely. doesn't sound. It, it, no, uh, it sounds it sounds dated in the worst possible way. Whereas sixties music doesn't sound dated to me, strangely enough. But seventies music well, sounds dated and by, by the eighties, I mean come on, give me a break. No, I I <laughs> disagree with you more. <laughs> go. I think I think it, it depends on I think it depends on, on the album. Yeah. In this, in this case in, in this case I'm not sure I, I agree I, I hear it as much as you do, Alan. Uh, I, I hear it a little bit, sure. But uh, there are, I think there are worse examples. Oh yeah, um, sure. I, yeah, I can't yeah, think sure. of any. I can't think of any. I'm, and I'm not referring to disco. I'm talking about, you know, uh, other albums, regular actual albums, music. Like, actual <laughs> music. Thank you, thank you. Jeez. But uh, um, yes, we, yeah, you are really opinionated, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. But it's, anyway. it's what I do. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Uh, next uh, is Old Dirt Road, and I, I, I love this song. I, I absolutely. Love this song. Um, it's a beautiful ballad. I mean, he he just takes it and, and does a uh, the the lyrics are great. Um, and it's one of the songs where the the lyrics are really good. Um, uh, I I really like this one quite a bit. Um, Alan, yeah, the lyrics on this one are co-written with Nilsson, so um, right. So it's a little bit different. You have a, a little bit of other influence in there, and it's it's sort of a nice touch. It's yeah, it's. Um, yeah, I like this one too, and it's it's got some nice imagery in it, you know, breezing through the dead wood on a hot summer day. Mm-hmm. I see a human being lazy boning out in the hay. You know, that's kind of a. Mm. It's it, it it doesn't sound like a John Lennon line. It might have been a Nilsson line, but you know, I was probably yeah, it probably probably was yeah yeah. Um, but you know, he he sings it and he sells it and he makes it his and. Uh, it's it's a nice track. By the way, he calls they call the band on the album the Plastic Ono Nuclear Band. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. He liked to change names around. Yes. And he gave himself his own pseudonyms too. Right. You know, right. Dr. Winston O'Boogie, Dr. Right. Fred Gherkin. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Actually, Ken, your turn. while he was working on this album, Yoko was touring in Japan with another Plastic Ono band. Her, her, I can't remember what it was, but it was like the Plastic Ono Super Band or something like that. She also oh, really? added another uh, word to the title. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, this whole album was really done in like between July and I think the final mixing touches were October. But really, most of the, the thing was recorded in July and August, 74. Um, mm-hmm. And he wanted to do it quickly for, you know, reasons that will probably be obvious to you guys, if not to all of our listeners. I mean, he had just come through the rock and roll sessions with Phil Spector, which were really, you know, zany. Um, right. And he he decided he wanted to, uh, you know, have this stuff rehearsed before they went into the studio. So he took out a. Uh, rehearsal studio and actually a, a room in one of the recording studios and rehearsed the band for a couple of days before they even started recording. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty tight, you know. He knew what he yes, wanted. Yes, that it is. That it is, yeah. On some of those run-throughs, like with uh, whatever gets you through the night, they are extremely they are extremely tight and they they switch to different on some of the on a couple of the other songs you know they there's a variety of beats on this album and and they do they do a marvelous job of handling it marvelous ken what what do you have to say about the uh, old dirt road i like it it's got a nice bluesy feel to it and i think there are times when um jesse ed davis this guitar playing is reminiscent somewhat of george harrison i know that one of the lines in there, trying to shovel smoke with a pitchfork in the wind, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure John said that was Harry's line. But I don't know what else Harry did right. But we should point out that Harry recorded his own version mm-hmm. of Old Dirt Road. And it ended up on an album of his called Flash Harry. Right. Ah. And uh, there's a, a CD in which there's also an alternate version of Old Dirt Road from Harry. So something to check out there. 
Mm-hmm. I kind of wish the two of them had done more writing together just to see what would happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that that could have happened because of the way they both were at the time. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. That it, it it it. I mean, they were lucky they they were lucky they survived what they did. I mean, given what went on in in Santa Monica and 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 all that stuff and and in L.A. Um, you know, but in any event. You know, a lot is made of, of uh, you think that John was always in an alcoholic haze, and um, there's no doubt that he had problems with alcohol while he was away from Yoko. But at the same time, look at what he came up with right. during that time. He, you know, listen to Walls and Bridges. If that isn't proof that he still could come up with great material despite what he was going through, mm-hmm. you know, and right. the Mind Games album. And then working with all the other people that he did with Ringo and David Bowie and Elton John Mm -hmm. and Harry. Uh, It was one of the most productive times of his career. Right. You know, one of the things that I wanted to bring up about this is that I always kind of resent when John said uh, towards the end of his life, he kind of looked at his best albums were Plastic Auto Band, Imagine, and then Double Fantasy. As if everything else in the middle wasn't as good. And I think sometimes he wanted to give that image because the whole mind games, walls and bridges, period, and rock and roll, he was away from Yoko. Mm -hmm. Maybe so that people might think that his best music was when he was with Yoko. But I think he was strong throughout most of his career. I mean, I, I have said that I like almost every song from his solo catalog. You know, obviously, walls and bridges, mind games... Those, those two albums back to back are killer albums, and I I look at that as being my favorite period of John's solo career. You know, uh, sometime in New York City, I'm not going to put on the same level as most of his other albums, but I generally like most of everything that he did. So, but to to release Mind Games and Walls and Bridges back to back, I think were two really strong albums. Mm-hmm. Mind Games is very overlooked, and um, Walls and Bridges was more successful. To be truthful, in part because he worked with Elton John then, and Elton was the biggest name. He was the hottest artist on the planet at that time in terms of singles and albums, and that really gave the album a boost. But even without Elton, it's a very strong album. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, next is um, What You Got. And this is probably one song, one of the songs that, if I had to say, this is one of the lesser points of the, on the album this would be it because it's just it the the whole thing just bounces a little too much and john does not sound completely comfortable with the with the rhythm i mean the lyrics are good you know uh or, yeah, but uh the melody just doesn't it's just not as grabbing as some of the others um the others are alan yeah, I, I kind of agree. This is another one that isn't among my favorites on the album. Um, first of all, you know, the the lyrics to, you know, this and, you know, nobody loves you when you're down and out. I mean, it, it, it seems to me like in both cases, he's taken sort of uh, phrases that were just sort of in the common, you know, parlance or something, you know, you, you don't know what you got until you lose it. I mean, these are just things that they're like expressions, you know, and he's made them mm-hmm. into songs. And it, it seemed to me a little bit, I don't want to say lazy, but, you know, not, not at the level that he had been writing. And so I found that a little bit disappointed. I kind of like, however, you know, the way he phrases that you don't know what you got until you lose it um the way he sings it the the melody he gives it i mean it all works you know um mm-hmm. but uh it, it it just seems to me to be a bit slighter than some of the other things on the album um you know it has uh th- that said i mean it is kind of arresting you know it's a it's a rocker and it's uh it it really kind of gets you moving i mean there's that but you know i mean for some of these songs that i don't like as much uh i should point out that move over mizelle was recorded during these sessions and was going to be on the album until 
pretty much the last minute. Mm-hmm. And it was taken off because he just had too much to uh, to have an LP that was going to be at the volume he wanted it on. You know, you have the more you have on it, you have to have the grooves a little tighter, and it. Um, you know, you lose a couple of dB here and there. And so he took off Move Over Miss L. He considered taking off another track. I don't think we know which one because that was another couple of dB of volume that he could have gained. And he wanted that, but he decided that he wanted to keep all the rest of the songs. Um, so I think Move Over Miss L. I would have rather had on the album than maybe What You Got or Go What You Got in Love, you know. Mm. So, I just thought I'd mention that. Okay. Mm. Okay. Ken? Huh. Well, uh, I completely disagree with Alan on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you disagree with what? me, too, I guess, because I didn't particularly care for it either. But go ahead. Well, I, I love what you got. Uh, one of the reasons why I love it is because it is a, an up tempo rocker. And if there's any criticism that I would make about this album, is that it needs a few more rockers. Almost everything is slow and mid tempo. And they're great at what they are, those songs. But I would love to have had more of what you got uh, on this uh, on this album. I love the sound of John when he's got a horn section, you know, kind of like uh, on Clean Up Time from Double Fantasy. It just works really well. It's got a nice rhythm feel to it, R&B feel to it. And I know that John said at the time that he had borrowed in some way, it's kind of an inverted riff from the OJs for the love of money in that song. And if you listen to the OJs recording, you can kind of hear it with what you got. I just think it's a really funky track. I wish there were more songs like it. And I also, when I think about what you got, for some reason, I think about uh, Paul Schaefer and his band on David Letterman, because sometimes they went into that song into commercial breaks, which I thought was very cool, because it showed that they, they were familiar with it. But, um, no, it's just, it, I love that song. John's vocals are outstanding. Baby, 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 give me one more chance. It just, it's, it's a really cool rock song. Yeah. You know? Okay. All right. Next is Bless You. And um, I, I do like this one. I thought the horn work was, was really beautiful. Um, it's interesting that in one of the outtakes, John says, it's harder to play slow, isn't it? Which is kind of a, an interesting thing to say in the middle of this i i thought it was a great song um i i, I did that's about all i can say uh, alan uh, yeah I'll, I'll agree with you on that um there are some really nice lyrics here you know the, the first two lines bless you wherever you are windswept child on a shooting star that's kind of a nice image the lyrics are sort of short and concise and you know in, in a way not you 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 expect john's uh, stuff to be a little angrier, and this is the other side of him, you know, that 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 doesn't get aired quite as much, and mm-hmm. uh, so I, I think it's um, and especially coming after what you got, which is so raucous, you know, this is a lot quieter and gentler, and um, and I think the the contrast works really well. John told uh, author David Sheff in 1980, he said, Bless You was about Yoko, but he said, I think Jagger took Bless You and turned it into Miss You, <laughs> which is really, <laughs> that's that's really kind of weird. Um, yeah. Ken? I think what John said was a stretch <laughs> Okay. <laughs> about, about Bless You and Miss You. But um, I love Bless You a lot. I love the lyrics. Not as many lyrics, but they're powerful with what he, what he says. Uh, remember, though love is strange, now and forever our love will remain. What I like most about Bless You is that it really has a jazz feel to it. It has jazz overtones. Mm -hmm. And I would really love to see more and more artists in the jazz field cover that song because I think they could do some really nice stuff with it. Yeah, it's just a beautiful song and a very underrated song. And, uh, you know, John has done a lot of, you know, apologetic confessional songs to Yoko uh throughout his solo career this is you know this is like another one and it's done really well okay next is scared and if there's one song that i was just that just floors me it's scared um that is probably the i it it was john's brilliance as as a as a lyricist as a as a 
you know, as a writer of melody, I mean, I, it's a perfect, as far as I'm concerned, this is perfect. It's a perfect song. Um, if I was to pick one of the two or three songs that are the best songs on the album, this would have to be one of them. I, I, I love this song a lot. The way he, the production, the, the, you know, the instrumentation, the whole thing is just fantastic. Um, Alan? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I think that what really makes this song work is the kind of music and arrangement that he gave it. I mean, there, it's you, you don't listen to it and think of it as scary in the you know the scary sense, like you know Halloween right. song kind of thing. But you know, you have a guy singing that he's scared. He says it like how, how many times in the start of the song, like eight times before he gets on to any other lyrics, you know, and you know that, I mean, this is the kind of thing John has done before. I mean, there's, there were things like this on Plastic Ono Band where he gets into the, the sort of raw feelings that, that mm-hmm. he feels and the music with that, you know, the steady beat, the kind of, you know, spare beginning. Um, it really completely reflects the feelings that are in the lyrics and and it it creates kind of an atmosphere around it that's that's really just perfect i mean that's that's um john the producer in a way at his best you know Mm -hmm. where he has a lyric he has a song and he knows exactly what he wants to do with it and what will make the song work yeah ken uh, I agree with everything the two of you said about it. This song has emerged as possibly my favorite on the album now. Hmm. I just love the whole production behind it. I love the lyrics, especially um, you don't have to worry in heaven or hell. Just dance to the music. You do it so well. <laughs> you know, And the buildup in his voice and when he screams on the well, well, well. It's just amazing. You know, I like the way that the the single notes are pounded, you know, at the very beginning of the song and throughout the song, Um, you know, the single beats that I'm referring to. I think that that gives it kind of a scary, ominous kind of feel to it. I think the production behind it was just superb. John's vocals were just amazing. It really works uh, on every single level. I just think it was a brilliant production. And and really just excels, you yeah. know, it really does. I I, I I agree with you. I agree with you. Next is probably uh, you know if there's one song outside of whatever gets you through the night that people know automatically, it's got to be number nine dream. It's been played so often. The instrumentation is so fantastic, and and the. The uh, the lyrics so long ago was it in a dream was it just a dream his voice is all in kind of a, a dream state the way they the way they did the production on it and I, I really like that um, and of course you hear May Pang in the background um, whispering John John it's, it's it's this is such a cool song um, I you know um, and maybe you know if there's probably one musical moment from John and May being together that you know that stands out probably more than anything else it's got to be this and what's really weird is uh, I in listening to the outtakes the outtakes that I came across few of them were any different although maybe there's uh, there's probably a lot more out there that that aren't you know aren't out on collectors uh, uh, boards but um, the outtakes I heard were all pretty much the same to the finished version, which is really a shame because I would have loved to heard have heard how this developed. Alan, yeah, this is I I, I agree. This is one of the best songs on the album. Um, Maybe my favorite on the album, um, mm. partly because it has that. You know, this is this is John in his more Beatleish mode. Although there really aren't. John Lennon Beatles songs that sound quite like this, you know, it's um, right. But, you know, his, his voice is great on it. The melody is great on it. It's, um, it's really a kind of a, a moving song. And, uh, you know, again, as in, as in, um, scared, you know, he, he kind of catches the atmosphere that the lyric suggests pretty perfectly. You know, once you get to this part of the album, you know, bless you, bless you, scared number nine dream, you know, from there on, it's, it's, it's pretty much all perfect. Um, you know, it's, 
well, not sure about beef jerky, although you know we'll get to that. But uh, you know, it's uh, like this. This is this this heart of the album. Let's say is 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 perfect. Mm-hmm. Ken. Uh, it's just a great song. There's no doubt about it. And the whole production behind it. Here's a, here's a case of where production really matters because it's got this full sound. It is kind of reminiscent of a full sound kind of like Strawberry Fields Forever was. You know, and the fact that John's vocals were the way that they – the way that they was recorded, it had more of a reverb or echoey effect, which works in this regard. And I have noticed through the years that um, – well, I don't know if I would say necessarily this is the most well-known song from the album because I think whatever gets you through the night probably always will be. But Number Nine Dream has gotten more and more airplay on rock stations in recent years because I listen to the radio a lot. And they, they picked this song out among some of the other classics from John. But um, I have seen much more airplay uh, in the last several years of this song, and deservedly so. I think it's getting recognized more. But I do believe that in this particular case, while it's a beautiful song, the production was just so perfect for it. You don't think it's been – because it seems to me that it's been played a lot longer than the past couple of years, past yeah. few years. I mean it's been, a, it's been longer than a few years. I mean this one's been a favorite back into the 80s. Yeah, after, uh, he, after he was murdered when his, his music was – you know, played in those days after pretty much nonstop on the radio. Um, this song got played a lot, partly, I think, because of the sentiments of the opening. You know, was it just a dream? And it, it, it mm. seemed suitable for the occasion almost, you know. It, and, it, and, it, mm -hmm. and because it was also really one of his, you know, more beautiful songs as, you know, in terms of melody and everything, it, it just was all the more poignant. I think I, I seem to remember hearing it a lot around then. I also think it was the first track from this album that I ever heard. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just driving in my car and um, it coming on the radio. John has a new album. Here's a track from it. So mm -hmm. I, I heard that way before whatever gets you through the night. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you're right that it's gotten more consistent airplay, but I don't recall it getting that much after John's death. Uh, really? But I, I certainly have heard it a lot in recent years on the radio. This is which, just my own personal experience. So. Which, which, Ken, which song do you play more on your show? This one or whatever gets you through the night? I don't know. Uh, it's probably <laughs> equal. I, really? I don't write down the number of times I play each song, but um, I would say it's kind of equal. You know, But I, I tend to try to play album cuts more than the hits. Because those are the ones that aren't as well known and deserve to be appreciated. Well, yeah, okay. So, I'm, but I'm I'm saying in terms of, in terms of which song, you know, if you were putting together a playlist of John's songs, you know, would you gravitate toward whatever gets you through the night, or would you gravitate toward this? You, hmm. you don't have a you don't have a preference. It's, no, I love them both equally for different reasons. There's okay. so much energy on whatever gets you through the night, and and Elton John really helps to make that record special. Mm -hmm. So, and hearing them sing together, hearing Elton's piano playing, hearing the sax playing on it, it's just an electric performance on, on the record. It's captured very well there. Whereas Number Nine Dream is more laid back, more dreamy, like the song suggests, and it right. works on that level. Yeah. So, sometimes I'm more in the mood to hear one, sometimes I'd rather hear the other more. But, which reminds me, we were, we were talking about the live version earlier at the Madison Square Garden. Next is Surprise Surprise, which is a, uh, a is a reggae beat. And again, I'm this is I'm I'm not sure if this one really kind of works. Although John likes it because at the beginning of one of the as they're running through it, he goes, "I like it." As the band starts up, you know, I, it's 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 okay. Uh, the lyrics are good. I mean, the lyrics are are interesting. I mean, he gets kind of graphic in the first uh, in the first. Uh, stanza where he says sweet is the smell of success her body's warm and wet she gets me through this god awful loneliness a natural high butterfly oh why i need her i need her i need her and of course and at that time he's talking about may um right. but yeah but uh, and that's typical lennon you know uh the way the way he was but yeah, the reggae, the the reggae, it it actually isn't too bad, uh, but the the reggae songs just kind of don't work as well for me. But um, Alan, yeah, I like this one. Um, 
as well as you know the few that came right before it. I, I think it's part of that run of really good songs that he has at the center of this album. And um, I like probably because of the imagery that you mentioned, um, and there are some other nice poetic touches in the lyrics. You know, she makes me sweat and forget who I am. The sweat and forget. You know, having an <laughs> internal rhyme within a line, I think is. Uh, I think that's the kind of thing that John actually prided himself on a lot. I mean, he <laughs> he could write beautiful melodies, but he thought of himself first. I think as a lyricist, and um, you know, so the arrangement that bothers you didn't really bother me. Um, <laughs> It doesn't really seem that much of a reggae track to me. It's 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 yeah. It's kind of uh, really yeah. Um, but you know that was that was a style that he liked. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, going all the way back to you know, I call your name. Um, right. So uh, yeah, I um, I think it works really well. I think it's a, a a nice song, good arrangement, and it you know as I say, it continues that run of really good songs in the middle of the album here. Mm-hmm. Ken, hmm. yeah, I like the song too. Uh, I think it's got a really good melody, a great hook to it. I like the sound of of uh, John and Elton John harmonizing together. That always works, although you don't hear the piano this time from Elton. Mm-hmm. On surprise, surprise. Uh, yeah, I always like that line, Alan. She makes me sweat and forget who I am. <laughs> makes you think that it's uh, not necessarily about love, more about lust, I would think. But yeah, I think uh, it, it's a good song. Uh, at the very end with the sweet, 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 sweet love. When I heard that, I would think of Drive My Car mm-hmm. with beep, 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 yeah. It kind of okay. reminds me of that. But yeah, it's a good song. I like okay. it. Okay. Next is um, Steel and Glass, and this is um, another one of the songs that I thought was a real highlight off this album. It reminds me of Working Man's Hero because it's so stark, um, and the lyrics working, are great. Working Class Hero. I'm Working Class Hero, thank you. And, it remi- and it's very stark. I like the uh, There You Stand with Your L.A. Tan and Your New, new York Walk and Your New York Talk. So I, I, it, it it's very, you know... Um, it's very descriptive. Uh, he, you know, he worked on the lyrics, but yeah, I liked. I, this is kind of Lennon at his pro, maybe at his most Leninist, uh, if I could, if I could use that word. So yeah, I really, I really like this. It's, it's him. It, it's almost an angry Lennon, I guess you could say. Um, Alan. Yeah, I wouldn't say almost. Uh, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's uh, okay. It's okay. as angry as he gets on this album, anyway. But I mean, it, it's you know, you, you leave your smell like an alley cat is kind of a, you know, you wouldn't say that about someone you were feeling very friendly towards. No, um, that's true. You know, and this seems to be, I think, overtly about Alan Klein, but he later in one of his sort of reflective interviews said, you know, yeah, it was about Alan Klein, but it's also about me, you know. So who knows what exactly he meant by that, but, uh, you know, he sometimes could could uh, do these angry songs and then years later take them as you know or or, in, or explain them as self-critical um, mm-hmm. but yeah this is uh you know it's 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 a nice angry song with again an arrangement that completely suits it and uh yeah i think that's um and and for me this is the last really great track on the album so okay yeah okay can can well, it's interesting you brought up Working Class Hero because to me, um, Steel and Glass is like the son of How Do You Sleep. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, when you think of where it's positioned on both albums, it's on the, the middle of side two. Um, they're both in minor keys. They both have horn sections that are articulated in the chorus. Mm-hmm. They're both very angry songs and uh, works really well. And And before I ever found out that the song was in any way connected to Alan Klein, I originally thought it was it was about himself because it does mention L.A. and New York and you think it's the same person so you think that it's about John, actually, so I right. do kind of feel like, although we've been told it's about Alan, it could actually be about John at the same time okay. so maybe it's a combination of the two, 
but it's another case of, again, really amazing production on that song. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that really benefits that song and, and, I think the whole album is really wonderfully produced. So, but yeah, Steel and Glass is an outstanding song. Okay. Next up is Beef Jerky, which I guess we don't really have to talk about too much since there's no words to it. But I don't think the music is too bad. Um, Alan? Um, you know, the thing about Beef Jerky, I mean, it's, 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 it's funky and it's of its time in the way that uh, Going Down on Love is in a way. Uh the thing about it, for either better or worse, and I'm not really sure, is that basically it was used as the theme music for the Lost Lennon tapes. So mm -hmm. we heard it, you know, several times, the beginning and end of the episode for 200, I think 219 episodes. <laughs> and that's an awful lot. And it's, you know, again, like you said, I mean, it's it doesn't have, it's, doesn't have lyrics and you know you kind of look to john for lyrics um it's you know apart from that it's it's kind of a nice little funky jam it would have made a great outtake <laughs> if it was an outtake i'd love it um mm -hmm. but uh you know it's um i don't know it 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 doesn't do anything for me either way really i don't hate it i just don't like it as much as a, a lot of the things on this album okay uh ken I like beef jerky a lot. I think that it's um, not of its time, Alan. You know, it is a very funky track, and I don't think less of a song necessarily because it's an instrumental. I mean, I know that you probably think there's less effort because you're not putting lyrics in, but a song can still be enjoyable. You know, I love a lot of instrumentals. You're, you're, you're talking to a guy who reviewed classical music for 40 years a lot of which is instrumental. It's, it's, it's not that it's okay. instrumental. It's just that since one of John's great strengths is his lyrics, this one doesn't have any. Okay, but nothing wrong with doing something a little different then. Right, that's true. That's true. And then, you know, like I say, if it was an outtake, I'd have snapped it up and said, wow, you know, they really could jam in the studio. He should have put this out. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, melodically, that the, the riff that, that keeps getting repeated is extremely catchy. Mm-hmm. And um, kind of like a lot of great R&B stuff from the 70s, I think it fits really well. And John loved R&B, and it showed in a song like What You Got. You know, like I was talking about the OJs before, how, how he borrowed from a riff from there. So, you know, it works on this particular song. I love the horn section. The horns really are outstanding on the album, where they're used. And, um, you know, I just, I really like it a lot. I know some people like to point out that there are these descending notes in beef jerky that make you think of Let Me Roll It. Hmm. Yeah. It's sort of a similar guitar riff. Interesting. Um, so some people might have been thinking, was he listening to Paul when he put that in? I'm not saying he did, but um, it is interesting when people would, would bring that up. But uh, yeah, and I like the fact that it was used for the Lost Lennon tapes. You know, if you're going to use an instrumental, you don't have any <laughs> from John other than this one, really. So, uh, yeah, uh, I like it a lot. I, I wish I wish he did more. You know, obviously his life was cut short and we don't know what he would have done had he lived, but he might have experimented more with instrumentals as well as so many other things we don't know. But. Right. Right. Uh, next is Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out. Second last track on the album. I, I don't have a I don't have a problem. I mean, this is a, this is an okay song. It's not probably a great song, but it's a it's a good song. But anyway, uh, Alan, your turn. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a bad song either. It's just not as strong for me as as some of the others. Um, and and again, the nobody loves you when you're down and out sounds to me like like it was taken from an old blues song and repurposed. Um, mm -hmm. as a John Lennon song and uh but you know so there there were some good lines in the lyrics nevertheless and uh, I've seen the one eyed witch doctor leading the blind <laughs> yeah. yeah you know i mean uh you know once the guy put a pen to paper you're going to get something you know that's right that's going to be interesting and uh so well it's you know no, nowhere near my favorite on the album and you know, again, I would rather have probably had, uh, you know, move over Mizell than that one, just because, right. because 
you know, it's a hard rocker. And uh, uh, if I were going to end the album, well, you know, apart from the little coda that we'll get to next, if I were going to end the album with this kind of song, I might have preferred to move number nine, Dream There. You know, that would have been a, a great le- ending impression, you know, for the mm-hmm. album. This is not quite as strong as that, I think. Okay. Ken? Um, I love the song. <laughs> I can see it as being just a great song to sing in a bar when you're really depressed. <laughs> I mean, really, lift your, lift your glass up and sing Nobody Loves You When You're Down and Out. Very depressing lines. You could tell that he, he just sounded very um, bitter, maybe, uh, when he says something like, I'll scratch your back and you knife mine. And he also said that he visualized Frank Sinatra singing this. I don't know if I could have heard that. But, no, I don't. Uh, I don't think you would have heard Frank Sinatra singing this one. Uh, but but anyway. um, I like it, and I also kind of like how the song ends with him whistling at the end, and it's kind of like he's trailing off in the distance. Mm-hmm. I think it's kind of a good way to end the album, although it's not really the ending because we still That's, have Yeah Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does. A, he does a minute of of Yeah Yeah, which I, you know, uh, that uh, seems like it. It kind of was stuck out there, but. I don't know. What, See, what now, you, that what? that to me is like like my mummy's dead, because mm. in in the it's just a very short thing stuck at the end of the album, and whereas my mummy's dead is about his mommy, um, this one really is about Julian. You know, it's it's less about the song than the fact that Julian came to the studio with him that day and was playing with the drums, and so John came in and said, "Let's do Yaya." played it on the piano and Julian drummed. So, mm-hmm. you know, in that way, it's just a certain kind of symmetry between that and My Mummy's Dead, I suppose. But right. It's a stretch, right. but, you know. Hey. Mm. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Ken? It's cute. It's something nice to tack on at the end. If anything, it only depresses me because had John lived, one of the things that I would have loved to have seen him do was to work with Julian mm-hmm. and to work with Sean and to know that this is all we got. Yeah. It's kind of sad in a way, but um, that's, way a, that's, just, a, that's a show topic on its own. What yeah. <laughs> would have happened with the two of them? Uh, you know, but oh, you you know, had John lived, if Julian had started, you know, recording and writing music as he did, he would have worked with Julian. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I think I, I think also he would have. I think it would have been yeah. interesting to see what he would have done with Sean. I mean, yeah, given both what of Sean them. has done. Yeah, and you know. even and even, let me let me put this one out. Would he have worked with Danny? That would have been interesting, you know. Because I mean, why, uh, why do you single out Danny? There's James. No, I'm not saying I'm not sing, Well, I'm not singling out Danny. But, well, because Danny is has been working more than James has. Uh, I don't know that that James's music would have been would have worked well with with John. But then again, I, you know, who am I to say? You know. So any in any event, um, okay, that was a really uh, I thought a pretty uh, good discussion on Wells and Bridges. Do you guys want to go around just really quickly and just have one more really quick shot at at what you think? Uh, you know, just to kind of wrap it up. I mean, I it's a it's a, I think it's it is a great album. There's no there's no question about it. But uh, and we basically you know said what we said in the beginning. But yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great album, uh, Ken, uh, Alan. Yeah, I think it, it, it's a strong album, too, and it also it has a certain place at this point in John's history, which was that, you know, from from my point of view, at least, you know, he had done a couple of really great albums at the beginning of, you know, 69, 70, you know, with Imagine Plastic Ono Band. Um, I was not crazy at all about some time in New York City. Uh, in fact, yeah. I, was, I was so disappointed about that that it, it uh, you know, I thought, well, like... Like, is he totally lost it or what? And then Mind Games came out, and then this, which was the last last album of original material that he put out before he then suddenly disappeared for five years. So, you know, you're thinking, hey, what's going on? I mean, he was back. He came back, you know. And so, you know, the, the disappearance for five years was also kind of disappointing because this was such a strong album. It looked like... It was just gonna like go upward from there, 
so yeah, that's what I think of Wells and Bridges. I mean, there's also the, you know, the, the we didn't talk about things like the cover, you know, with the flat right. different pictures um, taken mm -hmm. by Mark Gruen, um, where you could, you know, sort of recombine them in different ways to have different sort of pictures mm -hmm. of John with with different glasses and stuff, and uh, and all of the artwork from his childhood that right. was in there. I mean, that was really interesting to look at if, you know, you, I don't think any of us had seen these things before. Um, mm. so, right. It was a nice touch, a real mm -hmm. nice touch. It was, yeah. So, so Ken? Ken? Walls and Bridges is a great album. It's solid through and through. You know, I, I love it. It's one of my favorites. It's it's tough to say because, you know, I, I tend to look at mind games as being my favorite. Maybe sometimes I drift more towards the albums that are less appreciated and in that case mind games and walls and bridges are the two tops for me but um i love walls and bridges so much for the material and i, I do believe the production is outstanding on it and in no way is it dated at all okay uh ken sneaks in his little comment there at the end yes uh, <laughs> okay uh gentlemen uh, i think that'll wrap us up uh, for this week let me uh tell you folks you can download our shows at podbean.com on uh you can stream us on youtube we're on tune in radio we're all over the place. You can't. It, it, a lot of uh, podcast apps will have us. We're on Google Play. We are. Uh, you can get us just about everywhere. Um, we are also over the internet air, I should say, on Fab4Radio.com on Saturday and Sunday. Um, thank you, Matt. Also, also, you can say that every little thing is on Fab4 Radio. Yes, we could on we Sunday. Can, we can. We That's can say that right. too. Because um, they're back to back, Steve. Oh, okay. They're back to back. 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock at night is every little thing. 12 o'clock is things we said today. Okay. And um, you can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your comments about the show. We'd love your suggestions about uh, future topics. And we've had a couple and we are, we are looking at those. You can tweet us at things we said fab. We have a facebook page uh things we said today beatles radio fans we have a another facebook page for the fab four radio show it's just called things we said today let me go around the table and and ha have you have you guys tell everybody quickly where they can get a hold of you starting with you alan um you can um, get a hold of me on facebook at either alan cozen or alan cozen remixed and ken my email address is every little thing at att.net my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Beatles trivia every single week. You can win one of nine great prizes. And always check my special contest page because you never know from week to week. And you never know what day it's going to start when a special contest will appear in which you can win a real unique and super prize. So that's at kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay, and I did, did, as usual, I forgot to plug my little book, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, with my interviews with Davy Jones. It's on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. It's an ebook, and it's very inexpensive. Anyway, that's all we have time for. Um, for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, saying thank you for listening, and come back next time. Mm -hmm.